I believe, I believe I will go back home. Well, I believe, I believe I will go back home. I believe, I believe I will go back home and be... My mother's family has worshipped in this church for generations. The lessons I learned here, the power of faith, the importance of community, have remained with me and sustained me in the same way the black church has sustained the African-American people from the days of slavery to this day. The black church was more than just a spiritual home. It was the epic center of black life. Out of it came our black businesses, our black educational institutions. The church gave people a sense of value and of belonging and of worthiness. I don't know how we could have survived as a people without it. We had to have some individual and institutional armor in order to preserve our sanity. Culture says you're inferior. The Christ says you are an equal. From hush harbors to suburban megachurches, it's been a sanctuary in which black people could reinterpret the Bible in their own image and praise God in their own voices, creating some of the most sublime music the world has ever heard. The role of music in the black church is so important. It sets the tone for how you will feel when the word comes forth. It's such a distinct flavor of music, distinct from the traditional Western hymns, is its own thing. It's a very black American thing. Like all human institutions, the black church and its leaders had their shortcomings. We were very quick to address racism, but very slow to address sexism and abuse. Today, we stand at a crossroads. What will be the future of the black church? Where's the African-American church in Black Lives Matter? Where's the African-American church with environmental justice movements? I think that the church, particularly when the focus has been threefold, prophetic social justice, holiness, and spiritual empowerment and worship, when those three things are held together, the church has been a powerful force against sin, the sin of racism, the sin of oppression. I've spent my career exploring stories about black life, but there's one I've never told, and it might be the most important one of all. Okay, I want to say welcome, welcome to everyone that's on here, and I hope it's not too noisy, because I decided to come outside, um, <laughs> because it was so wonderful. Uh, last week, we was uh, five below here in Texas, and... Um, we had no power. We had our cell phones, but we had no power. I got a gas stove, so that gave us heat. So I want to say welcome, welcome uh, to the view, conversation among friends in our community, and happy Black History Month. All right. <laughs> this, this program is designed to speak truth among our friends. Uh, the conversation among religious, at times to be political. Uh, of course, we'll talk about COVID-19. So much things we'll talk about, but I want to introduce our wonderful co-hosts, and these are wonderful people that are um, among the community that's doing great things, and um, really think that it is an honor to have them. So we have Miss Madeline Sanders. <laughs> she is a uh, prison reform advocate, um, just awesome, awesome lady. Uh, we also have um, uh, Reverend Arkin Turner, Senior Minister of Unity of Chicago South Yard Wall Spiritual Community. How are you two doing today? Well, well, very well. That's what, how's the weather there? I haven't been out yet. I've been working inside all day, but it's a lot of sun. How's it with you, Madeline? Uh, I'm just looking, I haven't been out today I, uh, either, but I, I know I heard on the, the news report that it was in the low 40s today, which is almost oh. like a, 
Yeah, yes, summer. And, and that's, that's phenomenal considering <laughs> where we it's were a couple of weeks ago, even last week for that matter. It's sunny exactly. out here. Yes, yeah, but Chicago it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to I want to make sure before uh, we start too is that those who are seeing us and listening to us uh, in the chat box, feel free to give us your comments. Um, we also have an 800 number that Madeline will give you if you want to call in to us. Um, we also have an email, which is the view at yahoo.com. And you can say to us, uh, talk about this. Um, I have a friend who has a book. We're going to be doing book views here, book reviews here. And we want to showcase your, your book. Uh, we also want to pray for those who lost their lives, uh, their families. Um, we had 60 in Texas who died in the storm at different times. Yeah. And especially a mother, her name is Jackie Gwen, and she lost three children and a mother. Um, she had um, uh, lit the um, fireplace to keep warm, went upstairs, and hours later, the house was on fire. Many times, people we may say, you don't know, but we do solicit your prayers. Pray for her, that God will just surround her and hold her and, and the family as well. It's very hard to lose a child. Yes, and definitely, is. you're losing three children and losing your mother. Um, so we solicit your prayers. Wow. Um, just can't get a break. <laughs> Reverend Kim, we just, we just can't get a break. You know, it's always something going on. And politics, something always going on in the church, someone's going on in our lives. We just can't get a break. Um, and politics, we've seen the impeachment of the a president that didn't really go the way some of us wanted to go. Um, this week in the news, uh, Trump's tax returns are, are turned over to the Supreme Court. Uh, and then we have a new administration during the time of this pandemic. Um, Reverend Turner, how's Chicago doing with this pandemic, the COVID-19? You guys were looking pretty bad. Oh, we were. Well, we're looking better now. Uh, <laughs> our mayor was on <laughs> NBC, NSNBC yesterday and touting mm -hmm. the fact that our numbers are getting better and she is working very diligently to get the shots, the vaccine to those communities that are most impacted by the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So we have a very aggressive mayor that I don't always agree with, but she's still very aggressive. Mm -hmm. And we, we have a solid governor to support the effort to reduce the impact of COVID-19 in our state. So at this point, yeah. even though the numbers may not look uh, totally good, they are getting better. Well, we thank God for that. We thank God for that. In December, here in Texas, um, it says that we had 275,000 infected. And that wasn't a complete number, but as of December, that's where we were. Uh, mm -hmm. And when we had, <coughs> which concerned all of us, we had in December 1,700 people to die in prison for the COVID-19. Now, Madeline, that, that's, where you, that's where you are, and that's where your expertise is, where you are doing... You are doing um, prison reform and also writing on it and um, hopefully sending it to many politicians trying to make things change. So what's going on in the COVID-19 when it comes to uh, the prison and the jails? Well, um, I was just reading uh, uh, a, a study, some information earlier, a couple of days ago um, there's still a lot of prisons and jails that are being uh, seriously impacted by uh, COVID-19. Uh, the reason being, there's been very little effort by prison officials to really reduce uh, prison and jail populations. Um, and uh, and, and, and that's very disappointing. The ACLU actually filed a lawsuit last year to uh, force the um, Bureau of Prisons to start to uh, look at ways to reduce the prison population. They also filed a lawsuit against uh, Cook County Jail 
Um, but there's been a lot of wiggling and conversations uh, about what, you know, what could be done. But at the end of the day, uh, the populations have been reduced, like I said, very little when, we look, when I looked at the actual numbers and then versus the people who have been contracting uh, detainees or inmates who have been contracting COVID-19, including staff. And frankly, uh, I would say to you all that the numbers that we are hearing about in terms of how many people in various prisons have actually contracted the virus, how many staff people, especially with inmates, those numbers of coming going to the media are not accurate numbers. We are not getting the full picture. And for obvious reasons. And you know, my my thing is, and I'll just say this the low, the lower the prison and the jail population goes, that's like money walking out the door. That's potential um, that's true. jobs yeah. for people who are all the people who are employed to monitor uh, inmates and uh, uh, or at the jail level detainees. And so they really don't want to reduce those populations. And they'll do anything to try to keep them as high as they can. And, and so yeah. it's a struggle. And I, I would say that's going to continue, unfortunately. Yeah. And let's do that. We see that all the time. And we see that in not only the jail and prison population, we also see it in uh, foster care, and how sometimes it it is needed. Now, I would say that it is needed as a former social worker. But many times we see that if we work with the parents, give the parents rehab, help them find a job, do things that they really need to do to be productive, you might can save that family. But many times it's not, that doesn't happen. Um, immediately it is uh, um, placement, uh, and many of the parents feel hopeless, children feel hopeless. But now we, we've got a new administration. So uh, Reverend, what do you think? What do you, are you hopeful? Or what, do you, what do you see this administration that we didn't see with the last four years? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you, saw, you saw nothing the last four years. If, you, if your eyes were open, I mean, there was nothing to see. But, but abuse of the system, abuse of people, lies, deception. Uh, oh, I mean, we could go on and on of what was there to see. Uh, ineptitude. Yeah. Uh, liar. yeah. Oh, I mean, you know, <laughs> he came in lying, he left lying. So, <laughs> you know, probably the biggest lie was the fact uh, that I remember, easily remember is, when you elect me, I won't be on the golf course every day like Barack Obama. And he no. was elected, and his ass was on the golf course more than any president in the history. He probably was on the golf course more than the golfers. <laughs> he started with a lie, and then he left with a lie. I won the election. So that, that kind of wraps up what his four years were, lies from the beginning to the end. And, and, and you know, he was over his head. Yes, he did he one thing yes. correctly, though. I do want to give him credit. He did what he always does. He failed. Yeah. That's what he does. Yeah. Oh, and he did yeah. a great job of trying to bankrupt wow. this country like he bankrupt every business that he had. So in, yes. uh, the present administration has and attempted to act like an administration. Yes, We may not agree with all the things that they do. I was not a supporter of him prior in the primary, mm -hmm. but I do have to give him credit. He's brought decency and truth to the office. And I'm looking forward to more of what he and his vice president have done so far. They've been very impressive. And uh, I, I can't expect them not to do more of the same. You know, that's a... This, uh, it's hard for me to fast. But when we start going through that election, I'm going to tell you, when you really want something from God, <laughs> I was fasting. I won't say I fast fast because I did drink coffee and water, and that was it. I'm like, Lord, we, we, need, we need some changes. Your people cannot continue this way. What about you, Alan? Uh, 
what are you looking toward this administration that that you didn't get from the last administration? And I and I think you were very disappointed. Um, with the last administration, I'll tell you this. One thing that he did, uh, one thing I saw with uh, Donald Trump, whatever he said he was going to do, he really tried hard to do it. As far as um, appealing to his base, um, and something else that he did, um, his numbers. Well, he he uh, thanks to his son-in-law. Uh, what was passed into legislation was the STEP Act. The STEP Act is about uh, enabling uh, inmates to exit uh, prison. Uh, I have to go back and look and see what the actual numbers were. People got that out. I know it was more than uh, the last count that I saw was over like in excess of 3,000 in excess of 3,000 people that actually were able to exit prison as a result of that STEP Act. And the STEP Act also had, uh, it, it included uh, provisions for um, housing, enabling people to get housing, to get into job, and to get into job training programs. So that was the positive that he did. Um, and, as, and if, uh, as a matter of fact, as far as the number of people who actually were able to pay for prison, his number actually was higher than, than uh, Obama's. I can tell you and that. And what, letting, because I know that. As, as far as the number of people who were actually able to get out of prison as a result of the STEP Act. And the STEP Act actually was pushed through by his. Uh, his son-in-law, Jerry Kushner, whose father was incarcerated at one time. Okay, yeah, his father was incarcerated. Um, I was I was looking at um, many things that this administration going in uh, was true, as you said, to the fact, because when they said make America great again, we knew that the, um, the statement was to make America white again. But... Um, God being on our side, although it seems that if uh, we are taking steps backwards, we really are not. We're still moving forward, and we're doing that with the help of God. Uh, this is Black History Month. I see something that's on PBS, and I don't know if uh, Madeline told me about it to see it, and I immediately went to see it, and it's Henry Louis Gates. Did, did both of you, Madeline, did you finish watching it? Yes, I, I did. I watched both uh, episodes about the Black church. It was very interesting. Wow. Reverend, what about uh, you? Did you get a chance to see it? I saw the first episode. I did not see the conclusion. You didn't get a chance to see it? No. You know what? For those who are out there, this is something you must see. Uh, many of us um, as African-American people uh, and those um, who are not African-American people um, need to know the story of the black race and how we have worked to build this country, how we have suffered. And this was about the black church and how I heard Oprah say that she noted that many times, not only on this PBS segment for Henry Louis Gates, but she said it on her own show. If it had not been for the black church, the black, People would not have made it. Some brothers came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him in the house to lay him before Jesus. And they couldn't get in the house because all the religious folk were blocking the entrance. <laughs> So they decided to make their own entrance. And that is what I love about this text. This thing is so beautiful. Look at this. Everybody is in the house. They want to hear Jesus, but they don't necessarily want to practice what Jesus is teaching. And here you have some brothers. They try to get in the house. But you had all these people that had positions. Never confuse position with power. Right. Pharaoh had a position. 
but Moses had the power. Herod had a position, but John had the power. The cross had a position, but Jesus had the power. Lincoln had a position, but Douglas had the power. Woodrow Wilson had a position, but Ida B. Wells had the power. George Wallace had a position, but Rosa Parks had the power. Lyndon Baines Johnson had a position, but Martin Luther King had the power. We have power. We have the power. Don't you ever forget how much power. Never been a Houston boy. The black church has been the seminal force in shaping the history of the African-American people. It's the root out of which so many of the most celebrated aspects of black culture would branch. It's the first institution that enslaved black people and their freed descendants created. And it would become the longest lasting and without a doubt, the most consequential. African Americans adopted Christianity, but I also think they adapted Christianity. They made it their own. They created it so that it could provide for them something that was nurturing, something that provided catharsis, something that provided hope. Wherever African peoples find themselves in the diaspora, they're bringing with them ways of knowing, frames of reference, cognitive schemes to make sense of the world. It's a mistake to think that enslaved Africans came to North America tabla rasa. That is to say that they came with nothing. That is not the case. That they came bearing a rich cultural heritage. And this cultural world got filtered through black churches. We often think of religious identity as an either or. You're either a member of this religious group or you're a member of that. Religious practice in Western and West Central Africa was much more open. There was a wide and broad network of rituals that people could participate in, and people would move in and out of those religious zones. Um, we needed hope. We needed a way to uh, congregate together. We needed something that would take us over the suffering, and that was the Black church. Madeline, tell me what you saw. I absolutely loved it, absolutely loved this. What did you see uh, when he came well, to you, and what did you come 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 back with that you didn't well, know? Um, so, uh, I'll tell you one thing that really uh, interested me was how uh, the church uh, got involved in the, uh, the, the civil rights movement, and in fact, mm -hmm. uh, to a large degree, was a, a provided a leadership role in the civil rights. And even uh, going even prior to the civil rights movement, when we think we reflect back, remembering that Harriet Tubman, who was uh, part of the Underground Railroad, ran through uh, the church here on the south side of Chicago, uh, Quint Chapel. Uh, so that in, and so that church was very instrumental in, in, in enabling uh, blacks coming from the south, coming north be able to uh, uh, use the uh, Quint Chapel as a, as a stopping point. Um, and, uh, and then I, I also uh, was really interested when I was looking at the part about how the Black Panther organization and a lot of the young people who got involved in uh, protest movements uh, in the 60s. I was living in California when the Black Panther organization was formed out there with uh, Bobby Seale and he was the founders of that uh, organization. And uh, what, what, what I found very interesting was how the, the church was used as a, uh, as a, uh, a spiritual uplifting um, 
phenomena, if you will, to uh, for people to be able to express themselves as we're dealing with protesting and fighting for liberation of our people. Something about the songs that we sing and so forth. Wow, you know, yes, yes. Very, very uplifting. Yes, um, yes. Same songs like We Shall Overcome. I ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. Turn me around, oh yes. Uh, you know, those are just small examples of songs mm -hmm. uh, that were considered very uplifting, and they just they just actually uh, uh, got into your spirit and just inspired us to really oh, want yeah. to forge ahead, uh, you know, for a liberation of our people. And in spite of the police brutality and all the other wow. um, yes. uh, horrible things that went on, yeah. That's something. And you know, um, Reverend Turney, as you being a pastor and being um, a man of God that's bringing the message and in the ministry, and I know there's a lot of people come to you and they want to know why. Why is it that we as a people seem to suffer? Uh, why is it there's so much racism? Um, they want to know the why. You know, is God still with us? Mm. Uh, what, what other questions? What, what, do you, what do you get from this? From from the uh, documentary, from the documentary in, and the questions that have been given to you as a minister. Well, the question of where is God, <clears throat> we answer that in a little in a little different way than than some of the practices do. God is always present, and that's a very hard concept for some people to grasp. It's, it's a difficult concept to say in the midst of slavery, God was there. In the midst of yes. hanging, God wow. was there. In the midst of war, God is there. In the midst of poverty, God is there. And it's like, well, this, this God being there wow. all the time, I don't get it. I don't understand it. It doesn't yes. make sense. It must be a very mean God, a cruel wow. God to, to be there in the presence of all of this. Yes. this is, you know, we have a very simple answer. If you think that God is omnipresent, if you think that God is omniscient, if you think these things about God, then God yes. has to always be present. Now, yes. if God is always present, that means wherever you are and whatever's going on, God is present. So it's right. not God not being present. How do you see God being present? How do you see God, period? And the responsibility wow. comes back to the individual, not to God. <laughs> Not to God at all, because one of the things that we, we also teach is that we've been given the highest right that you could be given. It could be to receive. God has given us the freedom of choice. Yeah. And when you look at it that way, and you look back at our ancestors, so many of them made the, the choice that they were going to survive. So many wow. of them made the choice wow. that they were going to get through mm -hmm. the, years, the lynching, the yes. KKK. They were going to get through because of that divine right that yes. they were given, and they chose to use it and do things to support it that many of us are here today. Wow. So it is always present, never not present. And uh, if you think he's not there, it's not on God. <laughs> and you know what? That what came to me. You, I remember the story in the Bible is where uh, disciples and, and Jesus they were all on the on, on the ship, and being on the ship, and the storm came. And when the storm came, and you can look at that if you want to as the storm of life, it came, and it was um, they was afraid that they would perish, and they were doing all they can or, or they could to fix it and fighting the waters and fighting the storm and fighting the wind and father it clicked wait a minute jesus is on board and then they had to you go wake him up and sometimes in our lives we feel like that god where are you in the midst of all of this suffering and we 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 sometimes don't have answers because i have different ones that come to me reverend tell me this reverend why did this happen why did my mother die why did my father die why did my sister my brother my children and many times we don't have answers. Just like the lady, her three children died that we're praying for. We just, you know, our hearts just reach out to us. But many answers we don't have. But one thing Absolutely. we do know, one thing we do know, that God is present. God is present. 
And um, the black church has sustained us. It sustained us through slavery. I have asked that question myself many times. I've searched the answers. Why were these people of African descent brought here and allowed to suffer such egregious um, suffering uh, when it came to the beatings and the lynchings and the raping and just horrible, horrible, inhumane? And I still have not found the answer. But we are still here. Um, it could have taken the people out. It could have took us out. But we are still here. And we thank God for the black church. And many have turned from the black church. You know, we don't want to have anything to do with it. We don't see where it did us any good. But I say to all those that's out there, don't lose your faith. Don't lose your trust in God. It doesn't look good at times. Nobody can say it looks good all the time because it doesn't. But if you could just hold on like they did on that ship, I believe that a change is going to come for us, not only individually, but I believe us as a people. Um, we saw our first black president. Many of us said it wouldn't happen. I know I was working at the time and many the um, and I was a supervisor. And many employees came in and said, oh, that ain't going to happen. Did you see how dark his wife is? It was all these issues. But when it's time to happen, I don't care how it looks. God is able to bring it to pass. And now we have our African Asian. Is she Asian? Kamala mm. Harris? Yeah, South Asian. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't and think it would happen, but it did happen. And we thank God for that. We thank God for the black church. And not, I mean, I don't mean denominations. I mean the church. I mean the fellowship. Especially us as a people, as a people that believe in God. And we thank God for the black church. Um, and all the things that's been going on too as well as um, that I've seen that the the last president that we have, not mine, but on um, Whoopi always called him, uh, you know who, um, white supremacy really started again uh, flourishing. And we saw some horrible things. Uh, Breonna Taylor, um, Sandra, you all help me. What was Sandra's Bland. last name? Bland. Sandra Bland. I still think about her. Didn't know her personally. Uh, I pray for her mother, her sister. Pray for the family all the time. Because this is not new for us as a people. Mm -hmm. um, the young man that was leaving and they shot him seven times in the back. And again, it comes that the family is asking, where is God? George Floyd. Uh, you are giving me the take on George Floyd. They have where um, the other three officers that was there, they want to say it's third degree murder. So where, where are we going with that? Uh, uh, one thing I, I've, I'm going to say this about the um, uh, Jacob Blake uh, situation. Uh, I watched him uh, do an uh, interview with um, this guy on the Good Morning America Street, Street Horn, I think that's his, that's his last name. Uh, and he was talking about what his thinking was when he was confronted by the police. And he said that his his thought was, well, I'll walk around the side, walk around the car over to uh, the driver's side and I'm gonna say goodbye to my children. That's what he said. He said, I'm gonna say goodbye to my children because I was thinking, this is my last, this is gonna be my last day on this earth. And when I heard him say that, I thought, see, the move that he made was not smart. Now, who was this, man? Excuse me? Which one was this? This is what, uh, Jacob Blake, the guy who got shot seven times in the back. Okay, yeah, Jacob. Okay. Yeah, when he uh, when he uh, uh, started walking around after he was when he was confronted by the police on the uh, on the passenger side of his car, then he uh, and and he proceeded to start walking around the front of the car to the driver's side. Yeah. And that one cop who was following him. Man, and that cop had a gun in his hand. Um, you know, my thinking was, what was going through his mind? Even that was not a good move. Should have stayed where he was on that passenger side, 
and come and stood there and looked at that policeman right there because by walking around to the opposite side of the car, he gave that policeman an excuse to use his weapon on the guy that I was fearing for my life. I thought he was reaching in the car for his knife. And 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 that's not what you know. I'm, I'm and I'm thinking, you know, that was very disingenuous for that policeman to say that, but they use it that they use that expression all the time. Well, man, um, he felt he felt yeah. he was gonna he felt he was gonna die. So, yeah, uh, but that but that policeman was thinking, well, maybe he's gonna walk around the car and get the knife uh, get his knife out of the car. I mean, no, that no, I, I just was that. thinking. It no, thinking. that that was bogus thinking. But um, Jacob, the reason he was because he felt he was going to die. I'm thinking about to my children, because we we found out it doesn't matter what you do, if they want to shoot and kill you, they will. You could be jogging, you could be walking, uh, you could be on the cell phone, you you could reach in your glove compartment to get something out and you shot. So we've showed it's it's no what you do that causes this. It's what they want to do when it, when the police gets there. Uh, Reverend, what do you think on that? Well, I have to agree with you. It's very you can do when they have in their mind what they have in their mind. The white mm -hmm. mentioned the the fear factor. Those things, <clears throat> their actions. When you compare that to two incidents. A white boy goes into a church and kills nine people while yeah. they're praying, and yeah. he gets to choose to get some hamburger before he goes to jail. Yeah, yeah. And you, and then you go to up in uh, Wisconsin, and you find a white boy again from Illinois walking around with a semi-automatic weapon killing a person, injuring other people, mm -hmm. and he just walks right past the police. Yeah. Uh, I don't know yeah. if whatever you do. It doesn't matter. It matters because the things that you can, that gentleman, Blake, he didn't have to be shot seven times. They they could have subdued him mm -hmm. other, in another manner. Yes. So the, the shooting, the LeBron McDonald here in Chicago, the shooting part this this hunting of animals that right. that's what comes to me is hunting yes. animals and you shoot what animals. It is. humans yes. you subdue humans yes and they, and you force them to face the charges you don't shoot them down like animals yeah and that's what we find all over this country and and mm -hmm. with george floyd is that the it was like a champagne bottle the court popped out yes the protest started peaceful but they were saying enough our people have suffered enough at the hands of you of you and we that's wanted right. to stop and that's part of why some things are changing now and we thank god for the change we thank god so much that it, and it's not an easy change we see the shedding of blood um and many of have, have said well you know christ is our salvation it was shedding of blood but as our people, the change is slow, and it is the shedding of blood. I couldn't watch the George Floyd. I just, just couldn't watch it. And so many people said they did. But to see that eight minutes with someone that can put your knee, put their knee on your neck and snuff the very breath out of your body and feel it's okay, they see you as less than an animal because some animals are not treated in as such. Look how wonderful they treat their dogs. They get their nails done. They get them shampooed. They have babysitters. They have some to come and walk them when they have to be at work. More love and care is on some of their animals than it is on Black people or even other minority people. We also see the 865% rise on Asian Americans since the pandemic. Um, I don't know if you saw when someone came behind um, a 90-year-old Asian man and pushed him, and he fell on the side of the sidewalk. It was just really, really sad. And the target has been elderly Asian Americans. 
And many say it's because of the uprising saying that the coronavirus came from China. So that started that. I mean, it always has been a hate for those who are not of your print descent. Didn't matter, you know, whether you were of Asian or Hispanic or African American. But now the uprising is so to the point of they have to have special police uh, during this pandemic. So uh, we are praying for them as well. Okay, I think that's just about it. Our Black history, our Black church. Uh, is anyone, do you think of someone special in the Black history that comes to mind, Madeline? Uh, Black History Month. Well, this woman uh, who just got, she's a um, first Black um, fighter pilot. Uh, in the Navy. Oh, yes. Her name, in fact, her name is Madeline uh, Swagel. Swagel. Swagel, yeah. And she's a fighter pilot. Uh, first time an appointment like that has ever occurred. Uh, oh, yeah. And we go on YouTube and see the picture of her standing next to this um, fighter jet. It's it's really it's really and as the black woman, it makes me feel very proud to see something yeah. like that. Wow. Yeah. And you share that with us. Uh, and, she's, and she's the first one to get uh to get the her wings to fly as, as a fighter pilot. First one. First wow. black, and first black woman. Wow. Yeah. What about you, Reverend? What comes to mind to me is uh the first black mayor of Detroit, Coleman Young, and his history uh protesting while he was in the service and uh, protesting against segregation and feeling that as an officer to socialize wherever he wanted in the officer's mess and it didn't have to be in the black officer's uh, mess. Uh, and then becoming the first uh, African-American mayor of Detroit and then later the reprimand that was put on him and the other officers, other black officers who stood with him. I think it was about a hundred of them. Who said, you know, we're not going to agree to segregation. That's not, we're wow. not going to agree to that. Wow. And uh, they were all reprimanded, and uh, President Clinton uh, removed those reprimands back wow. in the 90s while he was in office. So my person wow. would be Coleman Young, former mayor of uh, Detroit. Wow, that is awesome. I'm going to give you someone that her name will never be in the book, uh, she will never be a shero to anyone but her family. Um, and that's my mother. Um, and I really did not appreciate Bernita Young until I became a mother myself. And she was gone. She um, was born in Arkansas, Blytheville, Arkansas. And uh, her grandmother raised her until she was 12 years old. And then her mom needed her. Um, but she came, she married my father who was abusive had 11 children. Um, then we moved to Chicago. And I look back and see where she raised nine boys and two girls by herself. Mm -hmm. They never went to jail. We never went hungry. We always had a telephone. We always had a television. Although one time it was black and white. I don't know if you all are old enough to remember the black and white. <laughs> I remember the black and white TV. Yeah. When the black and white out when TVs first came out. The, exactly, exactly. And to think that by herself that she finished raising her children and mm -hmm. she is a shero that should be honored like so many mothers and fathers who decided they would continue on raising their children and sacrificing for their children. Even when times got hard and we were on the west side of Chicago and I kept saying, when I get grown, I'm getting out of here. But when I look back, and I sometimes come and visit Chicago every couple of years or so, that happens. I look back at our humble beginnings. And I have to say to my mom that's no longer here, you did a good job. You did an awesome job. And when we came home from school, if it was beans and rice or neck bones or something was on that stove for us to eat. And now I look back, and I think Mal and I were talking about some of our kids, they can't do one child. But I oh, I can't do it. 
and she did nine by herself. Mm -hmm. And that's awesome. So that's my my tribute to the to the Black History Month and to all the mothers and fathers that's out there. Okay, I think we get ready to wrap yeah. it up. So any last words from either one of you? No, I, I'm 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 saying this was a, a a good first show, a good effort for a initial uh, show, and look forward to the next one. Absolutely. Okay, Madeline, and you are on. Um, you have you're on Zoom tonight, talking about prison reform, and definitely yeah. will be with you on that. And then um, that's just about it. So God be with you uh, until next time.